Shalom. This video is about the second portion in the book of Exodus, Shemot, called Vaera, which means I appeared. And so we have now God having recognized the plight of the Israelites. I will hear the cry of the Israelites. I have heard it. I will now fulfill my promise to them. Exodus 6 5. And God tells us the Israelites, they don't listen. So God appeals, Moses appeals to God and says, What am I going to do? They don't listen to me. So God tells Moses that Aaron will be a spokesman. Uh, and God's going to do all these signs and numbers, which will help Moses convince Pharaoh and the Israelites. So um, we have now the problem also raised about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. The first few times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart in response to the plagues. And then it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So what's the idea? Does God really get into Pharaoh's heart and harden it, make it tough? And most of the commentators say no. That's a expression saying that once you start down a road of sin and defiance against the right way, it's harder and harder to change it's as if God has hardened your heart. But you have done it to yourself. So Pharaoh does allow the uh, Israelites to journey into the wilderness um, after the plagues of blood and frogs, but then he changes his mind, and this keeps the pattern keeps happening. You get uh, a few more plagues. Pharaoh allows them to go forth to pray, and then he relents and makes them come back. And this goes on even at the end of all the plagues, which doesn't come in this portion. Uh, Pharaoh sends the army after him, even after the death of the firstborn sons. Um, now, we do have a very interesting passage where it says that um, I have until now been known to you as El Shaddai, but I have not made my no name uh, known as Yahweh, and I am telling you my name is yud heh vav -Heh. Um, they didn't know my name is uh, yud heh vav -Heh. But the Torah in Genesis clearly says that he did was called yud heh vav -Heh. I don't know. We don't know how to pronounce it, but that's how we pronounce it, those four Hebrew letters. Uh, so why? Well, either there are two different stories that are woven together, and the author of this one didn't know about that, which the Orthodox totally reject, of course. Other possibility is that you give different significance to maybe they knew the name Adonai, but they didn't understand the full implication and that uh, it's Adonai's redeemer here, um, possibly. Uh, and then we have one of the most interesting and important passages where God uses four terms of redemption. He uses the term, Vahotzeit, I will free you, um, Vahitzalti, and I will deliver you, I will redeem you, Vigaalti, and I will take you, Vilakachti, to be my people. This is chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And according to the tradition, each one of those four words of redemption, I will free you, I will deliver you, I will redeem you, and I will take you to be my people, are the reasons for the four cups of wine that we drink at the Passover Seder. And there's also a fifth term there, and we'll bring you to the land of Israel, which the rabbis weren't sure was a redemptive term or not having to do with the Exodus. And so that's why we have the fifth cup of Elijah, because we won't answer that question until the Messiah comes, and who announces the Messiah but Elijah. Now, the other idea about those four cups is that there were four phases to the horrible oppression of Egypt. There were four decrees that Pharaoh issued. They were forced to build Pitom and Ramses. Their lives were made harsh by bitter hard labor. Israel male infants were to be drowned. And no straw was provided for bricks. And so one of these terms was, yeah, of redemption was to free them from each of those four decrees. Now, the final issue is we have all these plagues in this portion, and they seem to go against the natural order. Well, first of all, that's not really true. If you read the newspapers for Egypt for 100 years, as I pointed out in another video, you'll see that these happen. These are natural occurrences. Now, it's not exactly blood in the Nile. It's a red, muddy discharge from the upper Nile that comes down, and uh, maybe a red algae, and it, the frogs don't like it, so they jump out, and they die and decay, and that leads to lice and insects, and all these things do happen, maybe not in two weeks, but over 100 years. And so when you're telling the story orally for hundreds and hundreds of years before it gets written down, as I point out in another video, it makes sense that um, our ancestors would see this as miraculous and telescope it into a shorter time. Um, now, the one final point here I want to make is that a lot of these plagues seem to be responses to Egyptian gods, because this is, after all, a battle between who's God, because Pharaoh thinks he's God, and we know who God is, so God's got to make it very clear to Pharaoh that Pharaoh is not God. So, the plagues seem to be symbolic of the defeat of the various gods worshipped by the Egyptians. For example, the frogs are a very ancient Egyptian symbol of fruitfulness, and uh, the, the insects symbols of rebirth, particularly the dung, beetle, and scarab, become plagues on the land. The sacred bull, considered to be the god of Apis, 
and the sacred ram, the god Amon, were devastated by the fifth plague, the cattle disease. And finally, Ra, the supreme sun god, was defeated by the plague of darkness. So there you have it. We know who's really God. Uh, that is an introduction to uh, Parshat Va'era, as we don't have the climax of the story, which then comes in Parshat Bo and Bashalach, when the uh, final plagues occur and the Israelites are redeemed from Egypt.